Well, Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson, Dallas Police Chief Eddie Garcia, thank you so much. We appreciate both of you. Um, so I know this is, we're about the second year, we're through the second year of this Hotspots policing program. And I want to know, what's the headline? Chief, we'll start with you. Well, the headline really is, is that with a plan uh, and with resources, uh, we can absolutely reduce violent crime uh, by concentrating in small areas that uh, really, really need uh, the city uh, in violent crime. So by reducing violent crime in those microgrids that we have, we can reduce violent crime not just in the grids themselves, but citywide. Mayor, what's your headline? Well, you know, I agree with the chief, and I would just add that uh, I think the, the big takeaway is you can effectively reduce violent crime in your city um, by being smart about how you use data and by uh, implementing strategies that take into account the realities of crime um, and getting past sort of the, the, the rhetoric and, and some of the, I guess, some of the bad PR around some of these terms like hotspot policing. Uh, people need to understand it better and what it really is um, because it's, it's, it's showing signs of working uh, here in Dallas. And so I think the real takeaway is um, it's not stop and frisk. It's not um, any of these uh, sort of things that people, I think, uh, in some cases um, think it is. It's actually about using data about who's committing crimes and where crimes are being committed to deploy your resources the most intelligently. And it's, it's working and it's lowering crime without increasing arrests and without using any of the heavy-handed tactics that maybe have characterized some other um, policing strategies that have been tried in some other places at different points in history but that's not what what we're doing here what we're doing here is something that's very smart and i really appreciate the chief for bringing it to dallas and chief the first year the result was an 11 percent reduction in violent crime uh, can you give us a sneak preview on what the second year looks like uh, same results, uh, and you know it's uh, you know every once in a while it's difficult uh, to improve upon uh, you know the success, right? Obviously there's successes and there's challenges, uh, but the year two results that we're looking at is we're we're, we're getting close to uh, pre-pandemic uh, total violent crime uh, in the city of Dallas. And how significant is that? It's very significant. I think uh, I think the the barometer for any large city in the country right now is to try to get back to those uh, numbers that we were pre-pandemic, uh, and although. You know, we still uh, we still have to you know um, continue to fight with regards to uh, murder and things of that nature. But when we're looking at the overall violent crime in the city, um, we're getting back to those levels, those 2018, 2019 levels, uh, with, with a lot more work to do. Uh, but certainly, when we look at the at the year two results, uh, when you compare the grids, the, gr the the grids today compared to where they were uh, for the for the months prior to the crime plan, uh, the grids are down approximately 31 percent. Uh, in violent crime, uh, and again, these are these were our most uh, you know our, our most violent uh, neighborhoods. I mean, to be a grid in our city, you had to lead the city uh, in murder, aggravated assault, or aggravated robbery. And so, uh, to have those uh, numbers, uh, it's it's a testament to the support that we get uh, from the mayor, from the council, from the manager's office, uh, and the amazing work that the men and women do. Um, and so, coupled coupled with that, uh, we've seen some successes here. And so, but again, <laughs> there's no like light at the end of the tunnel. There's just another tunnel. So we got to continue to grind away and, and wake up every day and rise and grind. Thirty-one percent in these grids. In the grids, yes. For in the two-year period. Yes. That, that's big. Yeah, and without displacing the crime to other areas, that's something that we were very um, sensitive to when we started this. We we said we were going to be very honest about the results. Um, and we want to make sure that what we're doing is not just sort of driving down the crime in, in one grid, but pushing it to another and calling it a success. And um, I believe we've got early data that shows um, we're seeing these results, again, without the heavy-handed tactics, without the civil rights issues, without increasing the number of arrests, in fact, the arrests are falling, and without displacing the violent crime. So um, it appears to be everything you would want um, a violent crime reduction strategy to, to be. I mean, it's lowering the crime and not at the expense of these other things. How do you do that uh, in the sense of how does, because a lot of people think just naturally, if you're in one area, the criminal goes to the next area. So you're saying that that hasn't happened here. No, it hasn't happened. In fact, uh, what the criminologists talk about, catchment areas. Catchment areas are the areas uh, immediately surrounding uh, a grid. We saw violent crime actually reduce in the catchment areas as well, uh, somewhere around 9%. And so not only did we see reductions in the grids, but actually reductions in the catchment areas, which are right uh, uh, outside of the grids. Uh, the reality of it is, and, and 
the, what the literature you know says is that you know, very few neighborhoods really that are responsible for a large a, a large percentage of the violent crime in the city. Uh, and so, you know, then very seldom do they move. Do they do they move? And that's the evidence that we're seeing here that the crime is not moving. Um, and, and that's something that I know that we wanted to keep an eye on uh, to ensure because that is that, that is one of the one of the things people will ask. Well, crime producing there is it going somewhere else? And we have not found that to be. You know, it was interesting. I was talking to uh, the professor you're working with at University of Texas at San Antonio, Mike Smith, and he told me that it's you're just talking about a seven percent of the land area that has the, the hot spots, uh, that has a big problem with violent crime. 93% of the city is not that way. I think that surpri would surprise a lot of people to know that. Mayor, what do you think? Yeah, I think it would, but you know, it, it, it actually makes some sense if you think about it in, in terms of, there, there are a lot of things in life that actually follow this pattern. You may have heard people refer to it as the 80-20 rule, but it's not always 80-20. Sometimes it can be 93-7, meaning, a disproportionate amount of the, the results sometimes come from a disproportionately small amount of the inputs. So in this case, we're talking about crime. So it, it is definitely the case that a larger percentage of the crime is committed by a smaller percentage of individuals than some people would think. And so that, what that means is if you take certain key individuals off the streets, you're gonna have a disproportionate impact on crime. Not everyone out there doing bad things is, believe it or not, equally driving the number of bad things that are happening. Um, like in any group, there are leaders <laughs> or there are catalysts. There are people who have a sort of a, a multiplier effect with their behaviors. And so criminals are no different. There are certain folks out there who are actually uh, responsible for recruiting more bad actors or spawning more uh, bad incidents and, and creating more crimes than, than their one individual, um, you know, than you would think. And so part of this is about getting, you know, targeting the right individuals and, in the, and being in the right places and having a disproportionate impact on the overall crime rate because you've, you've been in the right places and you've gone after the right folks. Where we are right now, Chief, you were telling me at the Valar Apartments used to be the number one spot, hot spot. Tell me about that. When you consider the fact that we divide the city of Dallas into about 101,000 grids, okay, we impact, we've impacted anywhere from the mid 40s to low 60s in grids. This was the number one grid uh, in the city. This was the, the most impacted grid in our city when we started the crime line. Uh, and it's no longer, uh, it's no longer a grid. Uh, and so this was great coming out here. Walked, uh, I've walked this complex many times and spoken to the residents. Uh, a beautiful complex with beautiful people that don't want to live next to the criminal element. And, uh, and really having an all hands on deck approach uh, to this uh, and it having not, not be a grid. Um, and again, uh, you know, we, we can't leave. There's always going to be challenges. We have to keep our eye on it, but it's, 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 it's pretty amazing. How long did it take to get off the grid? I took about, <sighs> took about six, approximately six treatment cycles of, Which, about, of, about, of about three months each. So a year and a half it took? Uh, about a, a little over a year it took to. to okay. Yeah. And my other question is, this is, I mean, doing this, um, my understanding is it's in three phases, but in the phase that maybe people can see most is you've got, on one hand, you've got these uh, crime response teams, 20 members, and then on the other, you have people who go in, you know, park basically, right, and then they start walking around. And I've heard that has really made a difference, that that's something that DPD has innovated that's not part of the typical hotspot model. Can you talk about that? Well, so the way we treat, the way we really treat our hotspots is really by visibility uh, and intelligence-led police, and those are the two ways we do it. Uh, but really, it's as simple as having officers arrive at a specific location at specific times, and we use that almost like a call for service. And so the officers will show up, and they will and they will be present. When we have our other PNI team, our Place Network Investigation Team, which is part of those members that, that, that you had mentioned before, uh, the officers are visible. They're making contacts. They're talking to people. We're not just not just in a moment of crisis. Just being uh, being present, uh, and that's made a tremendous. Uh, amount of difference uh, in our plan as well. Uh, the way we evaluate those things, that we're starting to see that the intelligence-led policing is giving us the same type of 
of outcomes as the visibility is as well. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so it's just being present, it's being engaged, uh, it's talking to the neighbors, it's talking to the management, um, it's bringing everyone to the table, and so that the people, and so that our residents see us, uh, see us present, and that, and that makes uh, makes a lot of difference. And I just want to add one thing to that and say, and, and that point right there, Chief, uh, about the the presence and how important um, that is, that is, from what I understand, um, why we've been able to achieve the results without having to increase arrest. I think most people think, well, the only way you could achieve results like that is to try to arrest your way um, out of your problem. And it, the reality is, is presence actually makes a big difference. And so having the police in key areas is actually a, a big part of this. And it's also why this isn't stop and frisk. But I mean, let's, just, let's just be real about this. Stop and frisk was a policy that was about indiscriminately stopping people that fit a certain profile just because they fit a profile. So you were African American, you were getting stopped and you were getting patted down and that's not what this is at all. Uh, this is about an increased presence in certain uh, key areas where crime has been high and it's about utilizing presence over arrest in terms of trying to deter crime before it happens in the first place. But it also is about being intelligent about where to be and about who you're targeting in terms of who you're going after. Because again, there's a disproportionate element to crime, like there is to a lot of things. And so not every area of the city contributes to crime equally, and not everybody out there is you know, contributing to the crime problem equally. So they're being smart about who they're going after and where they are, and it's showing the results. And it's doing it without arresting more people. I wanted to ask about the resources. I mean, first of all, how committed is the city to this program? Um, and my other question is, do you have the officers that you need to do this? Because, you know, we've seen across the country, Dallas is no different, finding police officers, right, is still an issue. So do you have the resources and the people you need to continue this long term? So just the first part of your question, I think we get tremendous support uh, from the city with regard to the, to the, to the crime plan. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, no, we don't have uh, enough officers. I mean, I would, we would love to have, we have, we, we have proven that with officers in an area, particularly in our grids, uh, we can reduce violent crime. And we'd love to have more grids. Uh, you know, well, we don't, we'd love to have more grids, but it would be good to put more officers in additional grids being data driven. Uh, and we're not there yet. Uh, we're not there yet. And so uh, we need to continue to grow as a police department, no question about it. I mean, the staffing shortage, this is a, this is a, this is a national staffing crisis. It's not just here in Dallas. Uh, there's not a major chief uh, colleague that I have that is, aren't going through the same uh, struggles that we are with regards to it, uh, which is why it's so important to have a data-driven plan. Uh, because at the end of the day, I can have 10,000 police officers. If we didn't have a plan, violent crime would, would not be reducing. Uh, and so but it's even more important when you have limited numbers and staffing issues that you do have a, a plan that's data driven because we have to do more with less. Are there, I, go yeah, ahead, Mayor. I, yeah. I, I'm happy to speak to that from the elected official side and tell you, um, you know, Chief, you've been doing a great job with what you, you've been given, but we want to give you more to work with because you need more to do more. Um, what we're doing here in these uh, hot spots, well, well, this used to be one, what we're doing in the places that are still hot spots, we need to be doing in, in more of them. There are, there are more hot spots that we'd like to be in that we can't be in because we don't have um, the personnel. So we want to help with that. But let me just say this. For four years, it's been my top priority um, to enhance public safety in the city and primarily to, to support our police department and, and to help them um, grow because we do need to hire more officers. But I think the chief will be the first to tell you um, the commitment is certainly there. Um, we want to, but it is a lot harder than just saying you want to and even putting a line item in a budget to say you will put the money aside to hire police officers. It's a lot harder um, to actually do it than it is to just say it and then even to, again, allocate the funds because you're trying to find the right people. You, you don't want to have ill set a community back um, years, decades maybe, um, if you, in, a, in an effort to just staff up quickly, um, lower your hiring standards, bring in the wrong people, bring in people who aren't committed to community policing, get, bring in uh, people who aren't trained properly because you're trying to rush them through um, a process. You don't have the right trainers. You don't have the uh, sufficient police academy. There are a lot of things that we have to have and that we're committed to giving this police department to make sure that we can bring on the number of officers we need and the right kind of folks. We, don't, we can't fudge this. We can't you know, half do this. We have to do this right. 
and it does take time. I think Chief will also tell you that even if you find one of these folks that's the right person, um, it's a couple years before a person that you just today says, I'd like to be a member of the Dallas Police Department, and I'll be a great cop someday. The, day, the time between that day and someday is a couple years. Um, they have to be trained and they have to have um, people work with them to get them to the point where they can actually do um, effective police work on their own. So there's a little bit of lag time in there too. So um, the reality is, is we are trying our, our best to hire as quickly as we can. We've continued to budget to hire more officers, but it is a challenge because uh, we're not the only city in the United States that actually wants those people when you can find them. And to, uh, to Mayor's point, um, it seems like you have buy-in from your officers uh, because uh, I would imagine that goes a long way in getting this crime down. Well, there's no question about it. Uh, you know, the buy-in from the men and women is amazing. Uh, one thing that I tell colleagues constantly is that you have to raise morale of your department. If your morale is low, uh, no crime plan will work. Uh, and let's face it, these last few years, you know, honorable men and women have not felt valued. They have not felt supported from a national perspective. Uh, I say this all the time. I mean, I, you know, when, when the mayor comes to speak uh, against my, uh, amongst my colleagues, uh, the support, uh, there, is no, there is no mayor more supportive uh, to public safety and police than our, in our profession uh, than, than our mayor. And that goes a long way, right? Because the men and women really start, be, be, start feeling valued, which is something that is not happening in recent years across the country. Uh, and that buy-in is huge. I mean, when you look at the fidelity of the plan, like as an example, one thing that we study is the fidelity. Uh, and officers uh, are in their areas when they need to be in their areas about 85% of the time, which is almost unheard of in a crime plan. Uh, and you know, if, if morale wasn't high, if they didn't feel valued, uh, those numbers, the fidelity portion uh, that we study would not be so high. Uh, that's certainly a barometer of morale. It's certainly a barometer of the fact that the men and women truly believe in this plan. Uh, and the results are showing uh, how amazing uh, work they're doing. Are the courts helping the city? Uh, as a whole, I think you've heard me say this many, many times, there are irresponsible decisions made by judges uh, in the name of social justice that are not making our community safer. Uh, you know, is that still that, happening? Uh, it does happen. Um, it does happen. Uh, by some, and I'll say this, I mean, I said this before, we don't get to say that we're serious about gun violence. Uh, when my officers are risking their lives to take individuals that have committed acts of violence with firearms only to be back on the street in days or weeks. We don't get to say we're serious about gun violence when that, when that occurs. Uh, but again, you know what, my men and women, uh, we, we, we fight the fights that we can fight. And if we have to respond back to a call 20 times, that's exactly what we'll do. Uh, we want to be the part of the criminal justice system that doesn't let our community down. And so we need to continue to do that. My other question is, I understand a third part of this uh, program, the Focus Deterrence, has been just started in June, if I'm not mistaken. And so my understanding is, is that this is where you contact uh, the most violent of the offenders, the problem makers, I guess, right? And you tell them, hey, if you continue, we're going to come after you but we're gonna give you a choice. We can help you out with resources, et cetera. Talk to me a little bit about this and how effective do you think this added, this new part of the, this third phase going into it? Well, focus deterrence is a tried and true uh, method as well. It goes hand in hand with grid work uh, as an example. Uh, but you know, that's, you know, what I always like to talk about, the grid work is the fever reducer, right? You know, we gotta reduce the fever, but the grid work is not going to be to cure the illness. Uh, and cure the disease. The cure of the disease is reinvesting in people and places. And it is a message, a message with all of our federal partners, our DA, our USA, um, and telling these individuals that, have, that we've identified as either repeat offenders, having been involved in shootings, gang members, probation, parole, things of that nature, to tell them, listen, we're not gonna tolerate violent crime in the city of Dallas. We will use every tool in our arsenal to ensure that you are not hurting our community. However, you know, we've partnered with uh, South Dallas Employment Project uh, and others to say, you know, if you need a job, if you need job training, if you need education, if you need help with mental health, if you need help with substance abuse, uh, and things of that nature, we want to have uh, we have we want to have a holistic set of programs set so that if you want to get out of that life, uh, we're going to do the best to help you. Uh, and it's we've had a lot of people we've had uh, you know over uh, two dozen people sign up for these services, and again. When we talk about individuals and, and places, and I say, you know, 100, 100 robberies aren't committed by 100 people, right? So these individuals uh, that have been involved in violence, that we want them to get out. 
because it behooves us all for them to get out of that life and to take the olive branch that we're giving them. But with, again, with the message, don't mistake kindness for weakness because we're not going to tolerate violent crime. But we do want to help because we feel that that is a tried and true method as well with the criminologists that is working. And is, how, how is the partnership with the feds in the sense that if there's a violent felon out there who's caught with a weapon, I mean, my understanding it just from you know, previous years is they should be going right to federal prison because that, that's a federal law. A violent offender gets caught with a gun, out they go. Is that happening? Uh, we're getting tremendous help uh, with our federal resources, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, our, our U.S. Attorney of the Northern District, uh, Leah Simonson, uh, has been unbelievable. Uh, has been an unbelievable partner. The relationship we have with the ATF, the HSI, FBI, DEA, uh, the marshals. Um, it's second to none. Uh, I've never had a better uh, better working relationship with my federal partners and having having been in two major cities, uh, it's second to none here and they've been fantastic. Uh, two other questions and that is, my first one is, I looked at the, the violent crime rate and uh, as of Saturday, year to date, uh, you're down. Uh, violent crime by 9.7%. Uh, robberies are down 10.35%. Um, assaults, non-family violence, down 14.9%, uh, which is the street crime you're, you're targeting. Murders, though, are up 6%. How do you explain that? So the way the crime, the crime reduction strategy is to reduce gun-related aggravated assault. That's the number one tell of any of violence in the city. It's, one life is too many, uh, but we jump to the, to, to, the, to the murder number often without looking at the cause. The cause of those murders is with gun-related aggravated assault. And so by reducing incidents, we will, we will reduce that number. Uh, but overall, again, and the, the, the randomness of some of the murders, uh, and the fact that, quite frankly, is many of our victims are also involved in some type of criminal activity that puts them in the wrong place at the wrong time also. Um, but we keep our eye on the ball on that gun-related aggravated assault because that's the driver. I can tell you, if my gun-related aggravated assaults were higher, and uh, or I didn't have, we didn't have those reductions, and but my murder rate stayed steady from where we've been in the last couple of years, I would be worried. Um, yes, no one's happy that no one, that when we lose a life, but when you look at the patterns uh, in police work, what you're looking at is you're looking at that gun-related aggravated assault and the total violent crime in the city. Another thing to keep in mind um, when we're talking about these uh, crime statistics, I think people need to remember um, that you're um, quoting year-to-date statistics and year-over-year -year statistics comparing Dallas to Dallas. Well, Dallas is getting, it's getting harder to outdo Dallas because Dallas has been outdoing the nation for two years in a row. So what we're comparing ourselves to with those numbers you just uh, read um, are our numbers this year compared to last year and then you know we could compare those numbers to the year before here's what's been happening nationally by comparison so people can understand uh, where we really stack up dallas is the only major city only top 10 city in america that saw every form of violent crime including homicide decline the past two years in a row so this is now year three we're talking about and again our violent crime in every category except for murder at this point in the year is down again from our numbers a year prior and, and the year before that. So we're hopeful that we are gonna work our tails off to try to get those homicide numbers down for a third year in a row. But we're, we're now talking about three consecutive years if we're able to succeed in that and having our crime go down, our violent crime go down year over year comparing Dallas to Dallas. Now, compared to the other cities in the top 10, the cities that are bigger than us, I can tell you that that murder number from just, let's say 2022, which is the last complete calendar year we have to look at, because 2023 is obviously not over. Dallas in 2022's murder numbers were at that point just 5% above their pre-COVID level, 2019 being the last calendar year before COVID, 5% above. New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Houston, other big cities like that were all anywhere from 35 to 50% above in 2022. So 5% compared to 50%, 40%, 35%. 
So we have far outpaced the nation, even in homicides and reducing them, but we have work left to do. As Chief is very fond of saying, uh, no victory dances around here. We, we, we want our numbers to be below the, you know, the pre back to pre-COVID levels, but we're only 5% away from being there. And, and no other city is close in the, in the top 10. I'm sorry. Uh, and my last question is, what is your, each of you, what is your message to residents? What do they need to do? Whoever wants to go first. I'm, well, I'm, I'm happy to go first. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. I appreciate that. I mean, I am the mayor. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, it, it, my message is um, what we're doing is working. Keep the faith, and we're going to stay the course. You, you have a chief here who is absolutely committed to this. When we were looking for a new police chief, I didn't have a whole lot of grandiose uh, things to say about what the next chief had to, uh, to have. I had something very simple to say. I said, I want a police chief to come in here who's gonna take lowering violent crime in Dallas for all of us who live here personally. So I want it to become a, I want it to be a personal challenge that they feel that this is something they need to do for our community. And we have that. We have a chief who, who Literally, I see him, and sometimes he's like, you know, he, he, he does not really sleep. I mean, he, he loses sleep over worrying about us and making sure that we are safe. And he's doing a, a fantastic job of keeping us as policymakers and his department focused on that crime reduction plan. A plan is only as good as the, you know, what you write down is only as good as, as what you actually do. Your, your fidelity to the plan is about his officers actually staying on task and us continuing to support the plan in the form of, um, of funding it. And I have to say, I'm very proud that we have stayed the course as policymakers in paying for what he needs and his officers have stayed the course in terms of staying on task and doing what they are, are supposed to be doing according to the plan. And that's how we have led the nation and had two consecutive years of declining violent crime in every category and we're working on year three right now. So I just tell the people of Dallas, uh, what you hear about what's going on nationally, that's not Dallas. That, that's, that, that's, that's Chicago, New York, LA, Houston. Dallas has a different narrative. We are, things are working here. We're doing things differently. We've taken this challenge head on. We've ignored people who want us to be you know, politically correct about what we want to do here. And we've actually just done what works. So we've made public safety number one for real by doing things that actually work and what data says works. So uh, we're going to stay the course. We're going to continue to do that. Chief, what do you want residents to, to know and what should they be doing? To have, they have a role in this, right? Absolutely. Uh, we're in this together. Um, together we're stronger. Uh, we need our residents uh, to be engaged with us, uh, to give us the information, uh, to work along with us. Uh, we need business uh, to help us as well. And when we talk about the focus deterrence plan, we talk about jobs, reinvesting in people and places. Uh, there's a broader group that needs to come on board to assist us in that mission. You know, the message that I give to our residents is that this department is not going to stop. We have a long way to go. Uh, for all the successes, there are times of, of challenge as well. Uh, but we're not going to stop uh, in that uh, our goal is to make Dallas the safest, largest city in the country. That, that, that's not hyperbole. That's what our goal is. Uh, and we're on track to do that, but we're not going to stop. Uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, and, you know, for all the successes that our, that our residents see uh, and positive things, they need to understand and know that we're not done. Uh, we're we are not done. Uh, success is a journey, not a destination. Uh, and we're going to continue to do the things that we have to do to get us to what our goal is of being the safest, largest city in the country. Dallas Police Chief Eddie Garcia, Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson, thank you so much both. We appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, man.